This is my fiance, Kate. Surprisingly, I don't get to cook for her as often as I like, and we're usually extremely split on where we wanna eat, right? Yeah. It's okay. So we're gonna cook an unforgettable fancy date night dinner that would dazzle anybody, and we're not using any fancy tools. If any of these dishes fail to impress Kate, and she has a picky palate, then I get to pick where we eat at for the next six months, and he's gonna hate it, because I'm gonna pick Olive Garden. Breadsticks galore. So with all that being said, let's make this, shall we? You can take your SO out to a restaurant, but wouldn't it be more special if you cooked it yourself? And you don't have to cook all these recipes, you could just pick one and it would still be special. In all honesty, it takes years of practice, training, etc., to be a fine dining chef, but that's why I'm gonna help you skip the line. If you've ever thought about stepping your game up, then you are in the right place. And every single thing in this is gonna teach you a tip or a trick that will make your everyday cooking better no matter what. Now, before we start, we need to talk about my two biggest chef tips. Number one, deli cups. They're reusable, they're stackable, they're cheap, which means they're smart and chefs cook smart. You're gonna want one quart, one pint, and one cup sizes. If you don't have these, that's perfectly fine, but the link's in the description for the ones that I used. Which brings us to tip number two, prep. Your day of cooking is only as good as your prep is gonna be. So if you wanna make more than one of these dishes or all of them, which I recommend, then this will take one day of prep and one day of cooking. Now, we can begin. Course one, tangerine golden beet Thai basil. We're gonna make a very easy tangerine granita. Quite literally combine two cups of 475 milliliters of tangerine juice and one tablespoon or six grams of tangerine zest for that extra tangerine kick. Come on, this to an 8x8 baking tray and place in the freezer overnight to freeze solid. For the golden beets, you'll need one to two large golden beets. Peel and slice those a quarter inch thick on a mandolin. Add this to a pint or quart sized container. Then in a medium sized pot, add half a cup or 220 grams of white sugar, three green cardamom pods, a pinch of salt, one cup or 240 milliliters of water, half a cup or 120 milliliters of rice vinegar. Place that bad boy in the stove, set over medium high heat, and bring to a boil. The second it boils, remove from the heat and pour directly over your beets. Lightly stir and then allow those brothers to sit until room temperature. That's literally it. The next Next day, it's plating time. Punch out holes of your beets and tie basil using a three quarter inch wide cylinder mold. This way you'll get some nice perfect circles. It's really not rocket science, come on now. Look, I'll be honest, since this was easy for prep, I made the plating a bit more tedious. Sure, you can add these little circles on, kinda I guess however you like, you could just throw them on or stick them in the granita, but I for some reason wanted to make a little circlet, shingling them, alternating Thai basil, golden beet, it is what it is. Anyway, take your frozen block of tangerine out using the tines of a fork, scrape that bad boy like the eyeballs of your enemy. Maybe a weird way to look at it. But look! That analogy led us to essentially tangerine snow. Ooh, wow! Now place a couple spoonfuls into a large bowl directly in the center. You gotta work quickly here because it will melt. Layer on your circlet of basil and golden beets. And now it's time for my fiance's taste test. The first course and also surprisingly the hardest to plate. Also, we still have our Christmas tree still up. I don't know how to take the top off. One piece of everything, you know, a little bit of that. There you go. Oh my gosh. What do you what? think it is? <laughs> I don't want to guess. I'm bad at guessing. Please guess. Is there mint in here? None at all. <laughs> it's really freaking good though. It's like a little burst of flavor. Like a gusher. <laughs> Nature's gusher. There's beets in here, I know that. But do you like the beets? No, they're so good. I wouldn't know they're beets. Yeah, exactly. That's the crazy thing. Okay, so tangerine granita, pickled golden beets, and Thai basil. Oh, it's basil. That's embarrassing. 8.5. I love a little good little palate cleanser, you know? On to the next course. Course two, chicken skin chips, raclette, and blackberry. Seems fancier than it really is. Chicken skin chips are actually really easy to make. First, you'll need about half a pound or 226 grams of chicken skins. Yeah, no surprise there. To get that many, you'll need about six to eight chicken thighs. Save the thighs for some other dinner, pal. To be honest, I probably could have worked that into this meal, but you know, it's too late. We're marching forward. Line two baking sheets with parchment paper. Lightly scrape your skins of their excess fat and then place them evenly spaced apart on your baking sheets. Grease the skins with cooking spray. Season them very lightly with salt. Cover with another sheet of parchment. Stack your other tray of skins on top of that and then another baking sheet tray for three total baking sheets. It's like a skin and metal lasagna. This is fine dining. Pop those into an oven set to 350 Fahrenheit and bake for 15 to 20 minutes. Do be sure to check them regularly and once they're golden brown and stiff, pull them out, place on a paper towel and drain. Let them cool completely and you can store these bad boys in an airtight container overnight, but do not refrigerate. Nobody likes something flaccid. I'm talking about the skins. We want them crunchy. If you're worried about food safety, you can cook them the day of, but you've been warned by the prep gods that this might not be a very good idea. Idea. For the raclette, we're gonna make a stable foam. This process is much easier with an ISI, but I'm trying to make it easier for you. I know you see a stand mixer, but you can totally use a handheld electric beater. For the raclette foam, soak a single sheet of gelatin in cold water. While that's soaking, grab a little saucepan or just a little thang. Add in half a cup or 120 milliliters of whipping cream and begin heating over medium low until it reaches a steamy heat. While that's coming up, pop a quarter cup or 64 grams of cream cheese in a stand mixer fitted with a paddle attachment. Bait that thang till soft and creamy. Then once your heavy cream is very hot and steamy, but 
not boiling, add in a quarter cup or 30 grams of grated raclette cheese. Give it a nice stir till melted, remove from the heat. And again, make sure that that mixture is not grainy, make sure it's not boiling. It needs to be off. You just want it to melt in the cream. Now in your steam mixer, switch to the big fat girthy whisk attachment and begin beating on high. Add your warm cream and keep on beating. Throw in your gelatin sheet and just let that whisk into voluminous and foamed up. Add additional warm cream. If it's getting a little too stiff, season to taste with salt and that's it. It should look creamy like this. For the blackberries, a basic jam. Saucepan, add two pounds or 900 grams of blackberries, one and a half cups or 275 grams of sugar. Let those sit and macerate, okay? That's the word. You can squeeze them if you want them to go by faster. And then just let them sit for 10 to 20 minutes. Pop that on the stove over medium high, add three and a half tablespoons of 38 grams of lemon juice. Let that boil, mashing occasionally with a hand masher for 10 to 15 minutes or until thickened. Don't forget to stir unless you like it burnt as Drain that bad boy and cool completely. You want this to be a uh, jammy consistency. Now to assemble, per plate, shingle three chips, offset to one side, a nice big fat dot of your blackberry jam. Do this in a piping bag, you could put it in a squirt bottle, and then an equal sized dot of raclette foam. It's simple, but it tells your little diner lover, homie. Uh, anyway, it tells them how to eat it. Now for another Kate taste test. Hopefully she likes it, because I, <laughs> I don't know if she's gonna like this one. Chips and dip, fried chicken skin, raclette foam, blackberry jam. I'm really good. Kate's gonna be like Cody. Basically everything you said was, that's good. I was like, can you describe the flavor? And he was like, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> what would you describe as a 10? Like what's a, what's a 10 comparable for you? Like Texas Roadhouse? Oh f yeah, Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> This is like an eight. I think that's a fair rating. Describe what you're tasting right now. It's a chip, really good. <laughs> There's a dip. Thank Josh, you. I grew up on kid cuisine. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, How? wait. Uh, uh, uh. I love chicken, but who cares about the dry breast? This is just the best part of it. Then you're hit with like this yin and yang. You got the jam, berry forward, and then you have this like, almost like liquefied, emulsified brie-like sauce. It's what I want out of a chip and dip, but like a little bit elevated. It's good. On to the next course. Course three. Broccolini peanut mole gremolata. Mmm, we love a fancy sounding one. First, peanut mole. So in a 12 inch pan, heat it over medium heat, add three seeded ancho chilies. You can tear them and to get them to fit. Press them into your pan for about 30 to 45 seconds. Flip and repeat on the other side. You want these toasted, not burnt. If you burn them, just throw them away and start over. It's gonna ruin the whole thing. Place those in a medium sized bowl and cover with boiling water for 15 minutes. Now in that same pan, keep it dry, set it to medium heat and add two slices of bread and one to two corn tortillas. Yes, dry. I want you to toast those until both items are dried out and lightly charred. Hard. There's a lot of dry stuff going on so far. Don't you be scared now. After that, add enough vegetable oil to your pan that coats the bottom, heat to medium, and add half a large white onion, rough chopped, and three cloves of garlic, also rough chopped. Season to taste with salt and saute until softened and lightly browned. In a small sauce pot, add a third cup or 72 grams of lard, heat that over medium until melted, then add one cup or 168 grams of raw unsalted peanuts. Please note, if you're using toasted peanuts, you'll burn them and I will cry. Simple enough. Cool. Anyway, fry those bad boys until they are a light golden brown, not all the way. Pour them into a bowl and let them cool off to finish toasting and they're cool enough to handle. While that's going on, cut one Roma tomato in half, char completely, either with a kitchen torch or under your broiler on high. Peel the skin and toss into a blender. Follow that up with your sauteed onion and garlic, your bread and corn tortillas, your rehydrated chilies, one small can of chipotle chilies and adobo, one tablespoon or 16 grams of piloncillo grated or dark brown sugar. Add in half a teaspoon or half a gram of cinnamon, half a teaspoon or half a gram of fennel powder, and a small pinch of allspice. Your toasted peanuts and lard, one and a half cups of 350 milliliters of chicken stock, ideally homemade, and blend until as smooth as possible. We're almost there. Next, you're going to need a five quart pot. Add two tablespoons or 22 grams of vegetable oil. Heat over medium high until nearly smoking, and then quickly pour in your peanut mole. Just be ready here because it's going to sputter pretty aggressively and might make a little mess. Okay, so stay back, pal. Stir that and reduce the heat to low. Add another cup or 240 milliliters of chicken stock and simmer for 45 to 50 minutes, stirring often to prevent burning. Toss in one bay leaf, stir that in until reduced thick and Delectable. Season to taste with salt. You can optionally strain through a fine mesh sieve so it's as smooth as possible. And it's done. This is probably one of my favorite sauces we've made this year. So slap your knee, tell your grandma, tell her she's beautiful, clap your cheeks on your face. It's that good. The gremolata is basic. Literally just mix together one red Fresno chili, finely chopped, two tablespoons or five grams of finely chopped Thai basil, two tablespoons or five grams of finely chopped parsley, two tablespoons or five grams, finely chopped mint, the zest of two lemons, you guessed it, or maybe not, also finely chopped. Toss that together and that's done. Now for the broccolini, we're gonna do it two ways. Separate the tops from the stems. Place them in a bowl, toss with vegetable oil, season it taste with salt, and place it to the side. For the stems, on the other hand, you're gonna cut those into one and a half inch segments. Well, Josh, why do I need to use the stems? The stems are yucky wucky. The stems are the secret gateway to reducing waste. 
or something like that. Bring a small pot of water to a boil, season that water lightly with salt, toss in your stems, and cook for about 30 seconds. Then immediately remove and shock in ice water. That is a blanche. It's a blanche. Sorry for the French homies. And it's, you know, I'm having fun today. Then on cooking day, you're gonna make a quick dressing by adding to a small bowl, one tablespoon or 16 grams of miso, any miso really, two cloves of garlic, grated, half a tablespoon or seven grams of white distilled vinegar, one teaspoon or three grams of lemon zest, one tablespoon or 15 grams of lemon juice. Then while constantly whisking, slowly stream in a quarter cup or 16 milliliters of extra virgin olive oil. You really want this to emulsify nicely. You don't want to pull a Josh and let it break and then you have to fix it with ice water and xanthan gum. Okay, not, not good. Season to taste with salt and dress your blanched stems with it. Now for the tops, you're going to need to heat a grill so that one side is extremely hot and the other side is completely off. Add your oiled up broccoli tops to the hot side and grill, flipping often for about three to five minutes or until lightly charred and cooked about 50% of the way through. I want a little bit of that crunch left behind. Now the assembly is easy. First on a large plate, place your grilled tops all around the center of the plate in the shape of a ring to leave an open circle in the center. Place your dressed stems all around in randomized areas, alternating different directions if you want it to look a little extra fancy. And finally, make sure your peanut mole is ripping hot. And I know you know how to fill this hole properly. The uh, one in the center. Don't take that the wrong way. My point is you can use either a spoon or you can place it in a squirt bottle, which makes it a little easier. Once it's filled out, then just in randomized spots, add your gremolata to taste. And optionally, you can garnish the sauce with a little bit of crushed peanuts to signify its peanuttiness, if you will. Now, let's see what Kate thinks of it. All right, course three. Stems are blanched and dressed. The heads are grilled and charred. There's a peanut mole in the center. Love mole. I'm scared because here's the thing. What if I bite it and then I don't bite fully and then it's like half in my mouth and out of my mouth on camera? Oh, go ahead, I'll cover. <laughs> There's shosh all over my mouth. No, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. Is it gone? You're good. This was very good. I don't know what I would do if I had to eat this in front of somebody. It would be like all over my so face. Good. It's so good. Flavor wise, 10. I have to sneeze. I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Continue. What if she was like, I have to sneeze and then she just disappeared for a second? Like, that's like a Kendrick <laughs> move right there. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Ah! Now on to course four. Cheers. <laughs> Course four, hamachi. Don't be scared, okay? It's fish, but it's Japanese sushi and sashimi inspired. And I also have a feeling this is gonna be Kate's favorite. Plus, Uncle Roger can do it, and if he can, so can you. So first off, you can have hamachi crudo without a... <laughs> a 12 ounce or 340 gram piece of raw sushi grade hamachi. Josh, where do I get that? Oh my God. Easily, you can get this online or at a nearby fish market. Before anyone complains about it being frozen, by the way, it is one of the safest ways to consume sushi grade fish. You don't wanna just like grab Grab a fish out of the ocean and eat it raw. Do your own research. You can get it online, nearby fish market. If there's a will, there's a way. First, we cure the fish. So start with a dry, small skillet. Add two star anise and two cloves. Heat over medium. Tossing occasionally. Separately in a small container, combine a third cup or 75 grams of kosher salt and half a cup or 99 grams of light brown sugar. Stir or toss together until evenly combined. And once your spices are toasted and fragrant, immediately toss those hot boys into your sugar salt mixture, cover with the lid, and vigorously shake for 20 seconds. This is going to perfume your sugar with those naughty star anise and clove fragrances. Take your fish out, separate the loin from the belly if it's still attached. Season your pieces generously with your spiced sugar salt mixture. Hit all the sides and optionally pop those bad boys into an eight by eight baking pan or a shallow half hotel pan. Cover with plastic wrap and cold smoke those using a smoke gun. Basically just fill that bad boy with smoke and let it sit for 15 minutes undisturbed. That's it. Whether you smoke it or not, place it in the fridge, covered for at least one hour to cure and up to overnight. By the way, smoke gun you can buy online, link in the description for the one that I use. Next, the pear component. I'm calling them boshi pears. Quite literally to a blender, add 10 umaboshi, which are little pickled plums. You can find them at Asian markets, super easy. Cover with half a cup or 120 milliliters of water and blend on high until completely smooth. That's actually it. Separately, you'll cut one Bartlett pear into bite-sized pieces, add them to a container, pour your umaboshi puree on top, toss together until coated. That's it. Next, bread and butter pickled char charred stems and kumquats. It's easier than it sounds. Literally, you just need four nice charred stems, cut on a steep bias, place those into a container, and six kumquats sliced as thinly as you can. I'm not gonna lie, cutting kumquats thin is a real pain in the start, but that's okay. Pop those into a separate container, then in a medium-sized sauce pot, add one cup or 200 grams of white sugar, a quarter cup or 75 grams of kosher salt, one teaspoon or five grams of celery seeds, two tablespoons or 19 grams of mustard seeds, two cups or 480 milliliters of white distilled vinegar, half a cup or 120 milliliters of water, pop that onto a stove, over medium
medium high, and as soon as it comes to a boil, take it off the heat and pour just enough pickling liquid to cover both your charred stems and kumquats. And that's it. I mean, you're gonna be left behind with quite a bit of pickling liquid. Save that in a container in the fridge. Thank me later. Assembly. Slice your hamachi thinly, but no thinner than about a third of an inch. Fold a piece in half to create a shape like this, and then just line the side of a shallow bowl with five to six pieces of fish per plate. Place three to five pieces of pears around the hamachi, three pieces of kumquat, three to five pieces of chard, pour a little bit of your pickling liquid in the dish next to the hamachi itself, and finish with a touch of extra virgin olive oil for the flex. Now let's see what Kate thinks. Okay, course number four. Kate's about to be late to something. We're rushing through this, okay? I'm sorry. This is so good. 10 out of 10 for the Play-Doh. I love it. It's like it. a little bouquet of flowers. 10 out of 10 flavor-wise too. We, we've hit the roadhouse state. It's like salty, but sweet. Very balanced. I like the citrus. That was the kumquat. I'm obsessed with this. Two more courses to try and get 10 at least two more times. So on to the next course. We're at the finale, course five. Don't be a little baby on me now. Push through. In service, this is your crescendo. Keep watching this video to the end and don't forget to subscribe. We all love you. This course is pork secreto, tamarind, rose, peach, and black garlic jus. Look, the pork secreto is easy. This is basically the A5 Wagyu of pork. You can find it at specialty butchers or online. But you can either do two six ounce pork chops or 12 ounce pork secreto. First, a tamarind glaze. In a medium sauce pot, add two tablespoons or 28 grams of duck fat. You can also just use vegetable oil, that's fine. Set the heat to medium and let that melt come Completely. Then add eight cloves of garlic, rough chopped, and three red Thai chilies, also rough chopped. Let that sweat, stirring often until they begin to soften about two to three minutes. Then add a quarter cup or 60 milliliters of whiskey, increase the heat to medium high, and let it cook down until it reaches what's called a sec which is basically just when almost all the liquid is evaporated. Then add one cup or 184 grams of white sugar, a quarter cup or 60 milliliters of chicken stock, half a cup or 125 milliliters of white distilled vinegar, and half a cup or 125 milliliters of fish sauce. While that's coming up, you need your tamarind puree because duh, quite literally you place four ounces or 113 grams of tamarind pulp, which is sort of this uh, funky looking thing. Cover with two thirds of a cup or 160 milliliters of boiling water. Begin mixing with a spoon until it turns into a rough puree. Then just pass that through a fine mesh strainer completely and place into your sauce pot along with an optional splash of shiradashi. Let that come to a boil, stirring occasionally, and reduce for about eight minutes or until you get a glaze-like consistency. Now this can burn, so don't take it too far. And also you're welcome because it's probably one of the greatest glazes I've ever made. It's unreal. Next, black garlic jus. Not actually a jus whatsoever. So don't try and go in the comments and be like, oh Josh, that's not a jus. Wah, wah. We're hacking the system here, okay? To medium sauce pot, set over medium heat, add three tablespoons or 40 grams of vegetable oil, two shallots thinly sliced, and four cloves of garlic also thinly sliced. Add a of salt to taste and sweat for two minutes until beginning to soften. Then add one and a half cups or 375 milliliters of chicken stock. Switch the heat to medium high and let that boil for three to five minutes or until slightly reduced and the vegetables are softened. Strain through a fine mesh strainer. Add your vegetables to a blender along with the cloves of five heads of black garlic. Around 50 to 80 grams. Blend that mixture using the hot strained chicken stock to loosen on high speed until as smooth as possible. You don't want this liquidy though, so just be careful there. Now while constantly blending, add three tablespoons or 43 grams of cold, yes cold, unsalted butter, about one tablespoon at a time until all of it's been added. Let that continue to blend, emulsify, and you should be left with a beautifully emulsified looking black garlic sauce. Listen, this emulsion will break easy, so keep it warm, but don't let it boil, don't let it simmer whatsoever. Season your taste with salt, and that's done. Now the peaches will go brown if you pickle them in a jar. So instead we're making what I'm calling a rosé fusion. In a medium saucepan, add two tablespoons or nine grams of pink peppercorns, half a cup or 125 grams of water, one cup or 182 grams of rosé champagne, half a cup or 125 grams of apple cider vinegar, half a cup or 217 grams of honey. Heat over medium heat until hot and steamy, and the honey's dissolved. Then pour into a bowl, set over an ice bath, and cool completely. Then just before serving, cut off the cheeks of one peach, sliced about an eighth of an inch thick, into half moons, place into a bowl, and toss with a few spoonfuls of your rosé infusion. Don't be shy, okay? You can add as much as you want, it's not gonna over-season it. Then just let this sit for a few minutes. Obviously, your grill should still be hot from the broccolini course, so just season a 12 ounce or 340 gram piece of Iberico pork secreto, pork chops if you want to replace that. Season generously with salt and pepper, pop that onto the hot side of your grill, and cook continuously flipping that bad boy until lightly charred in some spots, and it reaches an internal temperature of around 145 Fahrenheit. Oh boy, here we go. Oh, that's, is that cooked enough? Wow, wow, wow. Look, Google it, pal. That's the temp you want for maximum juice. Granted, you can cook it more because this particular piece can definitely handle it. Once it's cooked to your liking, brush generously with your glaze, flip so your glaze side is getting hit with heat, repeat on the other side, and just let that develop a nice thick lacquer, but don't let it burn. I glazed twice per side here, so. While your pork is grilling, you're gonna need another peach that's been pitted and quartered. Grill your peaches until they're nice and charred, but not too softened. Once your pork is beautifully glazed on all sides, let it rest for five minutes, then cut into three to four ounce pieces, slice that thinly, place into a nice large plate, slightly offset to the center, cut a separate single peach into bite-sized pieces, place 
place three to five of those next to your pork. Take your marinated peach slices and sort of fold them into little cones like this. Carefully arrange between the fresh peaches and the meat so they hold their shape. And finally, a nice big spoonful or two of your black garlic jus. Flaky salt in the pork if you're feeling naughty. And now, Kate taste tests. Course five. That's so pretty. Thank you. Pork secreto, peaches two different ways, and a black garlic jus. Ooh. That's really good. Is it bussin'? It's bussin' all right. 10 out of 10. Wow. That is bussin'. Do you like the way it looks or do you like the way it tastes? Both. It's delicious. Still good good. protein course will always save you, you know? It was also glazed with tamarind. Mm -hmm. What do you know about tamarind? It's in this glaze. I don't know what I would do without you. One of my favorite courses, hands down, salty, fatty, meaty, good. You had some good buzzwords in there. I like that. But we have the finale. Course six, dessert time. Pavlova with strawberries three ways. First part is the pavlova, which I'd recommend starting early the day of because it takes a while to make and you cannot leave it overnight. I'm being honest with you, okay? First blitz half a cup or 41 grams of freeze dried strawberries in a food processor until fine. If you don't have a food processor, a blender will work as well. Or I guess you could just put it in a bag and bait it up with a rolling pin. Keep that in an airtight container. To a stand mixer with the whisk attachment, add eight egg whites, whip on high speed. Once it starts to foam up, you're gonna add two and three quarters of a cup or 500 grams of white sugar, a couple spoonfuls at a time. Keep whipping that, adding your sugar, whipping, sugar, whipping sugar, Sugar until all of your sugar has been added. Now continue whipping on high speed. Now at this point, you should have roughly soft peaks, in which case if you do, add in two teaspoons or 10 grams of white distilled vinegar, two teaspoons or seven grams of cornstarch, and two teaspoons or nine grams of vanilla extract. Continue to beat until you get nice stiff peaks that are glossy and beautiful like this thing. Now add in half of your freeze dried strawberry powder and fold in until beautifully incorporated. Place that into a piping bag. These piping bags were far too small for what I needed. Pipe onto a silk pad lined baking sheet, about one cup sized failures like this. Then optionally using a Spoon, you can give them a little Jimmy Neutron. And by that, I mean a little uh, indentation swoosh. Pop that into a 300 degree Fahrenheit oven for one hour and pull them out and allow to cool completely. Let's talk chamomile strawberries. Steep two chamomile tea bags in one cup or 240 milliliters of hot water for five minutes. Take them out. Then add half a cup or 120 milliliters of rice vinegar and a quarter cup or 90 grams of honey. Stir together till thoroughly combined. Pour that over a one quart container filled with half a pound or 226 grams of fresh strawberries. That's fine if they're whole. And allow them to sit for at least 30 minutes, but ideally overnight in the fridge. Next, the strawberry jam from my cookbook. Link in the description for that, but I'm gonna give this to you for free because I love you. Cut two pounds or one kilo of fresh strawberries into quarters, place into a medium-sized sauce pot, along with two and a half cups or 500 grams of sugar. Let that sit for 10 minutes. Place on the stove over medium high, then add a third cup or 75 milliliters of lemon juice and bring to a boil. Mash occasionally with a hand masher and let that boil for eight to 10 minutes, stirring often or until it starts reaching a nice jammy syrupy consistency. Strain through a fine mesh strainer and cool completely. On to cashew praline. First off, on a silk pad, lined baking sheet, pour or one cup or 120 grams of toasted cashews. Try to keep them in a little mound together. Then in a small sauce pot, add three quarters of a cup or 138 grams of sugar, three quarters of a teaspoon or five grams of fine sea salt, and three and a half tablespoons or 73 grams of water. Let these start to hydrate, set that over medium high until boiling. Now you literally just boil this until it reaches a light amber color. Don't think you're fancy and walk away like, oh, it's fine. You're gonna come back to a flame, all right? Once it reaches that color, pour over your cashews and allow to cool completely. It should basically be like glass once cooled, so rock hard. Crack that into pieces, place into a food processor and pulse until you get a fine praline crumble like so. One of my favorite things, Chantilly cream. It's literally just a stabilized whipped cream, but it makes people him and haw at that name though. Whip two cups or 480 milliliters of cold heavy whipping cream until it begins to thicken, then add a quarter cup or 32 grams of powdered sugar, add one teaspoon or three grams of vanilla extract, whip until a nice medium soft peak. Again, think Jimmy Neutron's hair. Now we can assemble. You've made it this far. Thank you so much for making it this far. I love you. I appreciate you. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not already. Pick a nice plate, then in the center, add your pavlova. Lightly tap the top to crush a nice hole into the center. Pipe in a generous amount of your strawberry jam, followed by a nice quenelle of chantilly cream. Your pickled strawberries, which you can slice, but I chose to dice it into very fine cubes, also called a brunoise. A nice sprinkling of your cashew praline and some small leaves of mint alternated across the top. And if you're feeling a little extra cheeky, you can hit it with a light dusting of your strawberry powder you made earlier. It's time for the finale and a judgment from my fiance. Final course, dessert. Pavlova, chantilly cream, strawberries, pickled, dried, and in a jam form. That was so good. That was really good. I've never had Texas Roadhouse's dessert. I always get too full, but this is better. 10 out of 10. This is so good. What was your favorite thing you ate today? Hamachi. That one was really good. Most people are never gonna do this, but at the end of the day, most people don't even talk about how to make an omakase for your significant other, one night stand, date night, best friend, I don't know, your favorite fish in the fish tank. The point is, you now know how to do it yourself at home. Minimal equipment, but a lot of dishes. We'll worry about that later. But you wanna know what we won't worry about? B-roll. 